resolution during the appealing. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment and thank our corporate sponsor, LHC Structural Engineers. LHC is a local engineering firm in Raleigh with more than 40 years experience designing a diverse number of building structures to include hospitals, churches, corporate buildings, and college and university projects. A few of their notable projects include the Medical School for East Carolina University, the North Carolina Museum of Art, the North Carolina Museum of History, and the North Carolina Aquariums at Roanoke Island, Fort Fisher, and Pineville Shores. We're so grateful for their funding and support, which makes this speaker series possible. Please join me in giving them a big round of applause. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you all for being here today. It's really a great opportunity for me to be talking a little bit about my life and how I got here. Um, and I'm really grateful to Anne and others for giving me this opportunity to present to you all. Um, and so you see that the title of my talk is The Mathematics Underlying Cell Migration During Wound Healing. And while that's sort of, that was, that's a high level description of my PhD dissertation, um, that's really just gonna be one part of this talk. And really I'm gonna talk about how I transitioned from a high school student who was interested in mathematics um, up to an undergraduate student at NC State to then a PhD student uh, at the University of Colorado Boulder and now my position as a postdoctoral scholar at NC State and SAMC uh, where SAMC is located in the Research Triangle Park. Um, and so yeah, it's just a great opportunity to talk to you guys about this, this journey a little bit more. And really the big picture idea that I hope to present to all of you here today is I know that we all have um, sort of stereotypes of how we view mathematicians where we've all sat in classrooms that were really boring and we just have some bland person talking to us about equations that we can't understand and maybe it makes us feel very angsty and confused and overwhelmed at the large number of equations and formulas we're supposed to memorize and maybe we think that mathematicians are just people who seem to understand these really complicated equations better than us and do strange things like write these weird equations on windows for no reason and maybe they're just old and kind of boring and I hope to sort of change that perspective today and show you that well maybe those people are mathematicians but also while mathematicians can possibly work with complicated equations that don't make much sense mathematicians can also apply mathematical tools to more real world prob more real world problems such as biology with uh, mathematical tools and maybe even mathematicians like myself can collaborate with immunologists to tackle these problems and so give a much more applied uh, methodology to the mathematics. And also I just have this picture here to emphasize that I'll be talking a lot about my life in this talk just to hopefully emphasize that I'm also hopefully uh, somewhat of a down to earth person. So this is me and two of my mathematician friends when I was in college just going on a camping trip one weekend and doing normal everyday things because we don't just spend all of our time working with complicated equations. Um, so hopefully I can just give you a different viewpoint of what a mathematician looks like through this talk. Um, and so this begins as when I was a high school student um, up in New Hampshire. I did not grow up in North Carolina. I grew up in New Hampshire. And I would probably say I had a pretty unremarkable um, upbringing. It was pretty standard, nothing out of the ordinary. I, I guess I was an honor student all the way up through high school. And while I was generally good at math class, I was nothing special. Um, and if anything, I was a lot more interested in biology. And um, while I did well in, bio in math and biology courses, I found the biology to be a little bit more interesting. For example, when I was in high school, I took a course, um, AP Biology, and I was really fascinated when we did this lab on uh, fruit flies, or also which are also called Drosophila where we actually could use statistical methods and our understanding of statistics, our understanding of genetics, excuse me, to look at how different traits in these fruit flies, I think it was different types of uh, wing characteristics as well as eye color. And we could say if we start off with an, an initial population of flies that have this kind of characteristics, but then watch the next generation of flies and see how these characteristics change over time, we could actually predict what the, different po the, the next population of fruit flies would look like in terms of the number of flies with red eyes, the number of flies with round wings, the number of flies with sharp wings. And so that was the first time where I could actually get this really hands-on experience with biology. And I found that to be really exciting and interesting. 
Um, and furthermore, we had some other hands-on experiences in AP biology, where here I was collecting sea urchins with my class uh, one day at the beach. This is, of course, me from high school when I needed a haircut. But <laughs> yeah, and so really, I was much more interested in biology than math as a high school student, just because it felt more real and applicable to me. And so as I got on with um, high school and was approaching um, senior year, of course, the natural question then is, well, are you going to go to college, and where are you going to study in college? Um, and so I s was sort of in this dilemma of, well, I like math and I like biology. Maybe biology is a little bit more interesting. So I'm not really sure what to study. People don't seem to study both of those things, right? Um, and so I was fortunate enough that my parents took me on some school tri on some uh, visits to see some various schools in the New England and New York area. And one school that left a really big impression on me was Ithaca College, which is located um, in Ithaca, New York, the same town where uh, Cornell is located. And I emailed a professor beforehand, Donnie Novak, who is now a, a retired professor there. And he said, sure, when you visit Ithaca, you know, come to my office and let's just talk about what a math major is and you know, what you can do with that. And so when I visited with my parents, I went up into his office and I just told him, you know, I'm, I'm interested in studying math, maybe, but maybe also biology instead. I'm not really sure, and I don't really know if that makes sense or not. And he said, okay, cool. So you like math and you also like biology, but you don't really think they're related. And I said, yeah, pretty much. And so he said, okay, let's just start off with some really simple mathematical sequence. So he wrote down zero and one on a piece of paper. And then he said, let's just add the two numbers in our sequence and see what comes next. So we did 0 plus 1 is 1. And then he said, let's just keep adding the two previous numbers in our sequence and see what happens. And so then, of course, 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, and so on and so forth. And so we had this random sequence of numbers written on the board, written on this piece of paper. And he said, do you think this sequence is interesting? And I said, no, it just looks like a bunch of numbers. I don't really care. <laughs> and he said, what if I told you that this seemingly random sequence of numbers can describe a lot of different biological processes. And I was pretty skeptical. So the next thing he did was randomly he pulled a pine cone out of his desk and said, let's count the number of spirals in this pine cone. And here it's a little hard to see, but a, a spiral is sort of these continuous waves, uh, or not waves, but just consecutive um, little cones on the pine cone. And so luckily in this figure, we can actually have them um, sketched out. And of course, we counted 13 of these spirals in the pine cone. And he said, does that number look familiar? And I said, sure, we have 13 right here in the number. And he, th he said, do you think that's just random, or do you think that there's a reason why 13 in this sequence is also this number of spirals? And I said, that's probably just by chance. And he said, fine. And so he pulled out another pine cone, and we did it again. This one's a bit easier because I've colored it. And so now we can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight spirals. And of, of course, eight is also um, one of these fib uh, numbers in this sequence. And so then I'm saying, OK, so now you're trying to show me something. W what is it? And he said, if you understood m more about how a pine cone develops, you'll understand that it makes perfect sense that the number of spirals in this pine cone is a number from this previous sequence here, which we're going to call this sequence the Fibonacci sequence. And he said, it turns out that this really simple mathematical sequence is used to describe a lot of biological processes, and it turns out to describe a lot of biological phenomena. And so you can actually use mathematics as a separate way to study biology, even if it doesn't really seem that way. And this is when I really started to, got to get more interested in, in mathematics, because this was the first time someone had said to me, you know, you can use mathematics as a way to study biology. And then we went on a little bit more and he talked about, let's look at the ratio of consecutive numbers in the Fibonacci sequence and see what happens. And so we, we looked at, you know, one divided by, or sorry, one divided by one, two divided by one, three divided by two, five divided by three, and so on and so forth. And we noticed that this ratio of numbers in this Fibonacci sequence started to get really close to this 1.618. And then he explained to me that um, if you kept doing this forever and forever with the Fibonacci sequence, you would see that this ratio of numbers would approach this number here, which is called the golden ratio, which I'd heard of the, the golden ratio previously. I knew that it was part of a ratio involved with um, the Parthenon and that it had something to do with lots of aesthetic beauty. 
and he said, from this Fibonacci sequence, you can actually get a sequence of numbers that converges to this golden ratio, which is known as a very beautiful aesthetic number. And so you see that with this very simple Fibonacci sequence that I showed previously, not only can we describe some different biological processes, we also get lots of really interesting mathematical properties. And so this really simple mathematical idea can give rise to both biological insight as well as mathematical insight. And so that was the first time that I'd had anyone explain to me with, in simple terms, just how interesting and useful mathematics could be. And so he was a pretty good sell to me of, of taking, that, taking my time in college to study mathematics. And so with that, I did choose to study um, mathematics in college. But then, of course, I had the question of where am I going to go? And so again, I was, a, I was a senior in New Hampshire. So an obvious choice then would be the University of New Hampshire to get cheap in-state tuition. Um, sorry, just going to get this mouse out of the way. OK. But I had also spent 18 years of my life in New Hampshire and was getting a little sick of this small town that I grew up in. And so I thought that North Carolina seemed like a good area to get far away, but maybe not too far away. And I knew that UNC was a really great school, and I knew that UNC had this really good basketball program. So I thought, well, heck, I'll, I'll apply to UNC. That seems like a good place to go. Um, and I also thought, but I know that UNC is hard to get into out of state, so I will also apply to NC State, so hopefully one of those two schools will accept me. And then, of course, UNC rejected me, and I got into NC State. <laughs> So I had two choices. I could, go, I could stay in New Hampshire and go to UNH, or I could go to this new foreign area of Raleigh. And as you all know, I chose Raleigh. Um, and so that's how I ended up at NC State studying mathematics um, for, my, for my college experience. And I, like I, as I mentioned in the previous part, um, I did go on to NC State and study mathematics. And as you can imagine, this took a lot of time studying and lots of time in class and lots of t late nights working on homework problems and studying for tests. But again, I really do want to emphasize that I also made it a priority to you know, do normal everyday things and to balance a, nice, a good work-life balance. For example, this is me in my freshman year running the Krispy Kreme Challenge, which I hope all of you know about. OK. Yeah, all four years of my college experience, I ate a dozen donuts. and ran the miles, and so I'm very fond of the Krispy Kreme challenge. And you can kind of tell that I still need a haircut, but I'm working on it. <laughs> um, and also, I had a great, a great time going to NC State football and basketball games. Um, this is from a weekend when my friend and I actually drove down to Tallahassee to see NC State get creamed by Florida State. But it was still pretty fun, even if we lost. And so I really do want to emphasize that while I did a lot of studying, I also did try to maintain a, a nice work-life balance. But of course, I also did, I'm not going to lie to you, I did spend a lot of time in the classroom and studying and, and, what, and so on and so forth. Um, and so my freshman year of college, the math classes I took were um, calculus two and three. And then my, so the, my first semester sophomore year, I took differential equations, which I believe all of those are offered here at Wake Tech. And those were, you know, those were difficult because going from high school to college was a challenge. But you know, it was still felt pretty computational, and I could, you know, just sort of memorize the examples from homework and lecture, and then study those examples and figure out how to do apply them to tests. And so I did pretty well in those classes. Um, similarly, my sophomore year, I took linear algebra, which is sort of a combination of computational and theoretical, involving matrices. And so I did okay on in my linear algebra course because it also had a fair computational components so I could kind of memorize how to do different types of problems. But then towards the end of my sophomore year, I got into an abstract algebra and real analysis courses. And if you go to NC, uh, any uh, bachelor's college in math, these are sort of required courses and they're very, very theoretical. They're almost all proof-based and you have to you know, use logic to make your arguments. And I'm not gonna lie to you guys, I really struggled with these courses because this was the first time I couldn't just memorize how to do every type of problem. You really had to think through the different types of proofs and things. And so these classes really gave me a lot of difficulty um, in college. But I did you know, study really hard. And eventually, I persevered and passed them and moved on to the future classes. But I do want to emphasize that I struggled a lot in some of my undergraduate courses. Um, and so I mentioned previously that I was interested in biology, even though I still did decide to do the math major. 
Um, and so to, to sort of keep myself interested in this, I chose to also take some biology courses while I was a math major at NC State. Um, and some of these courses include um, organic chemistry, genetics, and cell biology. And I think organic chemistry did satisfy some of the requirements of my program, like out-of-department out of science requirements. But genetics and cell biology, I just simply took for the purpose of learning more biology. They didn't satisfy any requirements for my degree. And they just kept me interested because I st did still have this interest in biology, and I, I still found these classes um, really interesting. And so up until uh, my junior year of college, I just kind of was, taking, was progressing along a math major, but kind of randomly taking some biology courses. And it didn't maybe seem to make too much sense to many people. But finally, towards the end of my uh, junior year, it totally started to come together in harmony. Um, and that was through an NSF REU, where REU stands for Research Experience for Undergraduates. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity for undergraduate students. So for any of you who are going on to bachelor institutes after your time at Wake Tech, I would definitely um, look into this. Um, you can find uh, opportunities at this website um, or just Google NSF REU. And the basic idea is that you go to um, another institute for a summer and conduct um, an undergraduate research project. Um, and it's great because your housing, meals, and travel are all covered. Um, so I'll talk about how I went to Virginia Tech in a minute. And so basically, I, was, I had plane tickets to Blacksburg covered. Um, I had a meal planned for the entire summer. And I got to stay on campus at Virginia Tech while I was conducting this research. Um, and it also had a small stipend where in 2011, I made about $4,000 for this summer. So nothing extravagant, but a little bit of money to, to keep you going. And it's just a really wonderful opportunity to get experience with a professor, and you get to really take the mathematics that you've learned or, or whatever sort of field you're pursuing, you take your classroom experience and apply it to real world research problems. And so when after I, I applied to about seven or eight programs in my junior year, and then I got accepted to two at Virginia and Iowa. And so whenever, whenever anyone asked, I said, oh, well, Iowa might sound kind of boring, so I'm gonna go to Virginia. But the truth is that the Virginia Tech one was catered towards math biology. And so it was really no, a no brainer for me that I could actually use my mathematics background to now really study biological problems. And so that's why I chose to go to Virginia Tech for this summer as, at an REU program. And because I'm already saying how great this REU program is, I do want to emphasize that I do see that this experience at Virginia Tech as really the beginning of my career in math biology. And so I can't emphasize enough how great this experience was for me when I was in college. Um, and so the problem that we were looking into um, in this, pro in this um, RU program was looking at the, um, iron metabolic, the iron metabolic network inside of lung cells. And so the basic idea is that as we breathe, um, we don't, in the air we breathe, we also intake um, not just oxygen, but also some iron. And the iron is crucial to regulating um, the healthy functioning of our cells. And cells do this through various mechanisms. And the problem is that we also sometimes in, inhale um, harmful uh, fungus, for example, like mold, if you're in a moldy environment. And the uh, fungal infections inside our lungs are also very interested in sequestering this iron in the air. And so for most people, this isn't a big deal because we have a healthy immune system that can fight off these fungal infections. But for people with um, different types of diseases, for instance, um, asthma and cystic fibrosis, these fungal infections can be very harmful to them. And so there's this competition in the lungs between the lung cells and these fungal infections to sequester this iron in the air. Um, and so we were using mathematical modeling to study this sort of competition between um, compromised uh, lung cells and fungal infections to sequester iron in the air, which was a really cool project. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into this so that I can focus more on my PhD work later on. Um, but this is us at the end of um, the program. So this is my cohort of about 15 or so other undergraduates in math and biology. Um, this is, of course, me in the front who doesn't know what to do with his hands. <laughs> Um, and this was my graduate student mentor, Shanita Lee, who sort of led me through this project and helped me think about things to consider. And the PI for this program was Dr. Leinhard Lobenbacher, 
um, who I've recently since then found out is a very big name in the math biology literature. Uh, anytime I go to a math biology conference now, I see him, and so it's kind of cool to, you know, still see him and realize, you know, how much opportunity this, this research experience gave me. Um, and so then after this um, research experience, um, I was ready to go back to NC State and continue to do research, hopefully in the math biology area. So I just um, emailed a bunch of NC State professors in the math department saying, hi, my name's John. I've been doing some research at this REU, and I'm interested in doing more when I come back to NC State. Are you interested in having me? And luckily, uh, one of these professors res responded to me, and his name was Dr. Tom Banks, and he's, he's still a math professor here at NC State. And he said, yeah, I, have, I think I have some projects that you would be able to help me work on. And so we started working on um, using mathematical models to study flow cytometry data. So a flow cytometer is another biological measurement device where you're, you sort of are trying to count the subpopulations within a cell population. So each one of these cells here represents a cell. Each one of these dots represents a cell. And what you do is you can inject these cells with some sort of dye, and this dye inside of the cells can distinguish different uh, characteristics. For example, blue cells from red cells. And then you're just going to sort of uh, pump each of these cells through um, through um, a pipe one at a time, and the flow cytometer uses some um, some laser imaging to figure out, okay, here's the number of red cells that I counted, and here's the number of blue cells that I counted. But there are some problems with the way that this uh, measurement device measures this uh, dye. For example, this, this dye in the cell population decreases over time, so that can influence your measurements. And so part of my undergraduate um, research experience um, in the NC State Math Department was to look into mathematical models of this uh, dye leaking from cells. And so um, in this little schematic here, this represents, this is the inside of a cell, and this is the outside of a cell. And so these four little boxes here correspond to um, the initial dye that's injected in cells, and how it transitions to another dye that further transitions into two other types of dyes. And all four of these dyes um, eventually leak, leak from the cell over time. So that's what each one of these arrows represents. And so we were using these mathematical models to try and figure out how, do the, how does the dye uh, leak out from a cell over time. And what I want to emphasize is that this is the type of equations that we were using to analyze this process. And this looks pretty complicated. It's a differential equation with four differential equations. But if you just sort of focus um, on the first part of this equation here, that might look pretty familiar, like a differential equation that you've hopefully seen in a Calculus one course, where it's the, the exponential differential equation. And so I'm not going to, don't, don't get me wrong, you know, this whole thing over here is pretty complicated. However, I, want, I just want to emphasize that the mathematics, you know, in this equation here that we are using to model this process is not super different from the mathematics you've been seeing in a Calculus one course. And the really interesting part of this project was that we did actually have um, experimental data on the leakage of these cells, um, of the dye from the cells over time, where we could actually inject the dye into uh, red blood cells from some patients and track the, um, the dye concentration over time. And so here these blue dots all correspond to, um, to measurements of the, uh, of the dye concentration inside of cells over time. And this black, this black line corresponds to a uh, solution to this mathematical model, calculating the total number of dye in the cell population. And so now we're really comparing our mathematical modeling to real biological data, which I thought was pretty cool. And the very coolest part of this was that I actually got to go to Barcelona as part of this research experience um, because our collaborators in immunology were from Barcelona. And so uh, this is where I actually took this picture, was on a trip with uh, me and three other undergraduates at the time um, to go to Barcelona and, con and collect this, this, uh, these data points that we got here so that we could then calibrate our mathematical models to the data. And we also got to do some sightseeing. Um, this, is, this was my undergraduate advisor, Tom Banks, who I mentioned previously. And so I definitely never thought that you know, doing undergraduate research would take me somewhere like Barcelona, but it did, which was pretty cool. And the second best part was that we also got to publish our, uh, our work from this in um, a mathematics journal, which was pretty cool. And a very, again, something I never expected to happen um, in my undergraduate research. 
Um, and so eventually I continued on doing research and taking classes and eventually I graduated uh, with my bachelor's degree in mathematics. And this is a picture of me outside PNC Arena with my parents. And then of course, now the question when you graduate college is, well, what are you gonna do next? Um, and so while I was doing undergraduate research, I talked with a lot of PhD students who were also doing research. And it seemed like something pretty interesting to me to you know, continue doing research and further understand how we could use math to understand biological problems. So I decided to apply to PhD programs um, all throughout the US. And at the end of it, I had four offers. Um, I could go study um, back at Virginia Tech again, um, or I could go to Rensselaer Polytechnical Institute in Troy, New York, um, or Stony Brook in Long Island, or the University of Colorado, Colorado Boulder. And of course, you already know that I chose to go to the University of Colorado Boulder to study for a PhD in applied mathematics. So I'm not sure how well you guys are with what a PhD program entails, so I just wanted to have a really brief overview of that. Um, so I'm gonna talk about PhDs in, in all of STEM, but it's not too different from math or most other STEM fields. And the basic gist of it is they can take anywhere from four to eight years. So it's a pretty long time commitment. Uh, my PhD took five years, but I know people who have taken, this. the quickest I've seen is three and a half years, which that was very, very fast. And I've seen some people take close to eight years. So it can be pretty lengthy um, at times. And a question I often got while I was in, P in grad school for so long is, you must have terrible student debt then. But the truth is that the government and your departments pay for it. So I didn't pay for any of my tuition for my five years at University of Colorado. And actually, you get a small stipend while you're there to help pay for your rent and bills and everything. So while I was a, a PhD student, I think I averaged maybe like in the low 20,000s, maybe $22,000 a year. So again, nothing extravagant, but certainly enough to you know pay your bills and pay rent and maybe start a small savings account. Um, and the way that it typically progresses is that you take courses in your early, in the first two to three years of your program to further your knowledge. And then you have these written preliminary exams, which are pretty excruciating and difficult. Um, so my first two summers in graduate school were spent pretty much just studying for these written exams that were really, really challenging and very, very difficult. But eventually I passed them and I was very happy. And then once you're done with classes, you pretty much just spend the next few years um, conducting research with your research advisor. And if things go well, you can present your results in, um, in scientific journals and papers. And once you've done enough research, your advisor tells you, okay, I think you've done enough research and now you can start writing up your dissertation. And then you, you know, write your dissertation, which can be anywhere from 100 to 300 pages. And then you defend it in front of a committee, which is really scary. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that's sort of the general gist of what a PhD program in, in STEM fields is like. And so now I'm just gonna take some time to sort of go through what my graduate, um, what basically what my dissertation was about. And so this part may get a little technical, so please, if you have any questions about what I'm saying, feel free to stop me and ask me to clarify a little bit more what I'm trying to say. Um, so please don't be shy. And so again, from my title, my PhD dissertation research was on mathematical models of wound healing. And so all of us probably have experience where you have a cut on your skin, but almost magically, your skin just knows how to heal itself. Like maybe you put a Band-Aid on it, but you don't do anything. And then a month later, it's like nothing ever happened. Um, and so we were trying to look into how mathematical models could describe this process a little bit better. And the big picture idea of why you might want to conduct this research is that um, a concern for diabetic patients and other um, subpopulations in the world are chronic wounds, which are wounds that don't actually properly heal. Um, and you can imagine that this is a problem because our skin is the first line of defense in our immune system where they, the skin prevents harmful bacteria and other things from entering our body and making us sick. So you see that when you have a wound in your skin, this, this first line of defense of your immune system has now been compromised and you may be more prone to infection. And so that's why it's important to heal this wound as quickly as possible. But if, you're, um, if you have a chronic wound that doesn't heal, then you're gonna be very prone to infection. And so these chronic wounds are a big concern to the US healthcare system because they, they can occur in about one to 2% of the population and they did cost the US healthcare system um, $18.7 billion in 2016. 
And so we have, at this point in time, we have very little understanding of why these chronic wounds fail to heal, and it's very difficult to get them to actually heal. And so that's a very big concern for, for lots of patients in the US healthcare system. And so the basic part of the wound healing process that I looked into um, is called reepithelialization. And so that's a fancy way to say um, that early on in the wound healing stage, we have this wound. And then the first step, as you may imagine, is we have this fibrin clot that is put on top of the wound to sort of seal it and prevent, prevent you from bleeding. And there's also this sort of sticky, ma sticky matrix that's put down inside the wound area called collagen. And once this fibrin clot and collagen have been formed, then what your skin wants to do is reestablish this outermost layer of skin to prevent um, bacteria from making you infected. And so um, skin cells from your epidermal layer of skin will then migrate on top of this collagen matrix to reestablish the integrity of your skin. And so my PhD research was on this migration of epidermal skin cells into the wound area as a means to close the wound. And so um, it's a little hard to see this video, but um, this was done in collaboration with biochemists at CU Boulder. And here th we have uh, two separate populations of um, skin cells from this epidermal layer. And we simply just grow a bunch of cells um, in, a, in a Petri dish or something, and then scratch away half of the population to mimic a wound. And then we can actually see that these cells respond to this wound by moving into the wound area. And if you can see this video here, we see that the video on the right shows a, p a cell population that migrates a lot faster into the wound. And so we, um, what happened was the experimentalists treated the cell population with a chemical called epidermal growth factor, or EGF. And when we treat the cell population with this wound, we see that the whole cell population migrates a lot faster into the wound. And so part of my dissertation was to look into how do chemical signals like this regulate the migration of cells into the wound area. And furthermore, uh, we see, it's a little hard to tell in this video here, but these cells maintain physical connections to their neighbors as they migrate into the wound. So how do these physical connections also coordinate the migration of cells into the wound area? <coughs> and so this is just to summarize that, that the main questions of my PhD disser dissertation were how do these physical and chemical cues regulate the coordinated, coordinated coordinated migration of cells into a wound. And so I'm going to talk about this physical aspect of my dissertation here. Um, and so while I was studying these um, types of models early on in my PhD, I le read a lot of previous models on wound healing. And the prevailing assumption was that if I am a blue cell here and I'm trying to migrate into the wound area, I'm going to have a harder time if I'm connected to my neighbors through these physical connections called cell-cell adhesions. And so the dominant hypothesis in the math biology liter liter literature, excuse me, was that if I lose these connections to my neighbor, then I'll have an easier time migrating into the wound. Um, however, I looked at this video here and I thought, well, that seems really strange because all of these cells are still you know, choosing to be physically connected to their neighbors. They're not losing these connections yet they still migrate a lot faster. And so I thought, what if instead the basic idea of how cells use these physical connections to their neighbors is that if I migrate into the wound area, I'm gonna use this physical connection to pull my follower along with me. And so my hypothesis was that actually these, cell, these cells use these physical connections as a means to promote migration by pulling on their followers with them as they migrate into the wound. And so the way that I investigated these two hypotheses on the role of these cell-cell adhesions on migration was by deriving two separate models of this process. So the first model is gonna be called model H, and this is where we're assuming that these cell-cell adhesions hinder migration into the wound. And so these physical connections prevent migrations into the wound area. And the second model, which I'll call model P, the um, assumption here is that these cell-cell adhesions promote migration into the wound because if I'm moving forward, I'm gonna pull my follower along with me. Um, and so using these assumptions, I could go ahead and derive some complicated looking equations like this one. I don't expect you to make any sense out of this, um, but I do wanna emphasize that, again, similar to your Calc 1 course, this is just um, a time derivative, like du dt, where u here represents um, a cell density in time and space. 
But then it does get much more complicated on the right-hand side here because now it's not just derivatives with respect to time, you also have derivatives with respect to x. And so maybe if some of you have taken uh, multivariable calculus, some of these partial derivatives will start to make some sense to you. And so what we have here is called a partial differential equation because you have things changing not just in time but also in space. And really, um, all that you really need to understand about this model is that I've plotted what's called the rate of diffusion, so the rate of how something spreads for both uh, models H and P here. And in blue, we have model H. And what you observe is that as your cell density increases, your rate of diffusion goes down. So with increasing cell density, your cells will spread less, your cells will spread more slowly. However, for model P, where you assume that these cell cell adhesions promote migration, you see that as cell density increases, um, cell migration also increases. And so the basic difference between these two models is that for one, as you have more cells, your motion decreases, whereas with the other assumption of model P, as you increase the number of cells, your motion increases. Um, and now here I can just depict um, how these different types of these model simulations for model H on the left and model P on the right can be fit to actual experimental data with this um, video of cell migration in the top here. Um, and so basically what I'm doing is I'm sort of using um, this data to sort of specify where I think the uh, location of the wound area is, so the interface between cell the cells and the, um, and the actual wound. And that's depicted with these dots on the right-hand side here. And I just um, used mathematical methods to sort of fit um, different combinations of these model H and model P to these definitions of the leading edge. Sorry, where the leading edge is the interface of the cell population and the wound. So I'm basically looking at how quickly the uh, front of the cell population migrates into the wound area. And what you can think of each one of these uh, plots here as just taking a cross section of this 2D um, wound space. And so when um, these profiles are large, that would correspond to a high cell density. And when these profiles are are small, that would correspond to an empty cell density. And what you see is that with model H, where these cell cell adhesions hinder migration, you get really high cell densities in what's actually the wound area, which is very inaccurate. You know, you would expect to see cells here, but you don't over time. Whereas with model P, the model of my hypothesis, we, we do see that the qualitative nature of these areas of high and low cell densities match up pretty nicely um, with the wound, where we see this sort of you know, zero cell density located, uh, predicted in the wound area. And so when I saw these simulations, that's when I first started to say, okay, I think my hypothesis that cell cell adhesions promote migration into the wound is the more correct one. But in the math biology literature, it's never enough to just show that your mathematical model does things nicely. You also have to show that you can make predictions with your mathematical model. And so what the, our experimentalists could do is they could actually perform the same experiments where you take these cell cell adhesions and remove them so that cells are no longer connected um, in the population over time. And so of course with my model where I'm assuming that cells use these to promote migration, I would assume that if you lose these physical connections that cells are going to have a harder time migrating into the wound. And so this is um, the resulting experiment where on the left here, we still have these intact cell cell adhesions, whereas on the right-hand side here, we have lost these cell cell adhesions. Um, and so it's a little hard to tell, but what you can see is that for the full 48 hours, these little white dots corresponding to cells are all migrating towards the wound with intact cell cell adhesions for the full 48 hours. Whereas if we look at these ones over here, we see that around 30 hours, these cells just sort of stop moving, and they fail to really move forward into the, into the wound area. And to sort of uh, summarize this, I just counted the number of cells that entered the wound area over time in these experiments, and this green curve corresponds to the, um, the count of the number of cells that entered the wound area without cell cell adhesions, and we see that it levels off around 30 hours Whereas in blue, I have the, um, the normal cells that have intact cell cell adhesions. And we see that we sort of have a, a steady influx of cells entering the wound area over time. 
And for, for, for at least on the scale of 48 hours, we see that these intact cell cell adhesions promote healthy wound healing into the wound area. Um, and so here's, um, again, a paper that I got to publish when it, while I was in graduate school. And the main conclusion from the study was that during the wound healing process, cells primarily use these cell cell adhesions to pull their followers forward as a way to promote migration. Um, and so as I mentioned, you know, at the end of graduate school, you have to write a big, long dissertation and, and uh, defend it in front of some big committee. And so here's me after my defense, so I was already happy, um, shaking hands with my PhD advisor, Dr. David Bortz. <coughs> um, and so again, this question pops up when you finish graduate school of, okay, well now you finish graduate school and you have a PhD, so now what are you gonna do? Once again, I think that's the third time I've been faced with that question in this talk. And most people in PhD programs take one of two options. They can either go to academia where they will pursue teaching and research, or they can go into, the pro into industry where they may you know, work for a private company or maybe a government lab or something. And, at this and so this is me um, in my last year of graduate school, so about a year ago, trying to determine what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I am more interested in the academia route. Uh, I think I find teaching to be very satisfying and I like using research to try and understand biological questions with mathematical tools. And so I wanna you know, stay in academia and, per and try and become a professor um, sometime soon, hopefully. And so unfortunately for most people, you don't go from being a PhD student to being a professor. You still need to have, um, you need to boost your resume a little bit before you can quite get there. And so that's why what's called a postdoctoral scholar position, in which case you have your PhD, but you go to a new position to try and continue your re research program, publish more papers, and better understand you know, the, the math literature and how to, how to conduct research. And so I decided to apply to postdoctoral scholar positions um, about, about a year ago. And so as you, you kind of know the answer already, but I was, you know, trying to figure out where to go for my postdoc position, and I had three offers um, in Florida, North Carolina, and Virginia. But it turned out to be a really easy, um, easy, easy choice for me because a week after my defense, I got married, and the RTP area provided the best, um, the best career options for my wife, and so we were very happy to, to move to North Carolina um, once I was done with graduate school. And so that's how I ended up um, at my current postdoctoral position at SAMSI, which is a statistical institute in RTP called the um, Statistical and Applied Mathematical Sciences Institute. It's funded by the National Science Foundation, but it's run by uh, Duke University, NC State, and UNC. And the program that I'm currently in at SAMSI is on uh, personalized medicine, uh, where personalized medicine is a current approach to try and take algorithms from machine learning and artificial intelligence <coughs> and to try and create more tailored, individualized uh, treatment strategies for medical deci decisions. So here's just a definition I pulled from the internet where personalized medicine is a form of medicine that uses information about a person's genes, proteins, and environment to prevent, diagnose, and treat disease. So for example, you can imagine if both you and I have some sort of disease, you know, the best treatment for me may not necessarily be the best treatment for you. And so in personalized medicine, we're trying to figure out how can we figure out the best treatment for a patient given their individual history? Um, and I won't go too much into the details of that because I've only been at that position for a short period of time, but it has been nice to you know, dig, dig into this slightly different field than my math biology PhD program. Um, and so before I conclude today, I just wanna wrap up with some very general lessons I've learned here where I want to emphasize that while I've sort of highlighted the successes of my trajectory here, I've also buried under the rug a lot of the failures of this process. For example, I didn't tell you about how I, got, well, I did tell you that I got rejected from UNC uh, along with other schools and undergraduates. I didn't tell you guys about all the postdoc positions I did not get offered to that I applied to. I didn't tell you guys about the five National Science Foundation grants I've written that took months and months and months and then they got rejected. Um, so I really do want to, emphasize that there's been lots of, lots of failure in this process, but a small number of successes have gotten me to where I am today. And really these successes came from seeking out opportunities. For example, applying to research experience for undergrad programs and you know, just talking to people in the area, trying to find opportunities for myself. 
Um, also, I've had lots and lots of mentors through this process for, um, you know, officially I had my, my research experience for undergrad advisor. I had my undergraduate advisor. I had my, uh, my PhD advisor, but I also had lots of mentors in terms of more senior students to me. So for example, in undergraduate and graduate school, I always was looking for students who are more senior to me that I thought I should model myself after and try and see sort of what they were doing to get ahead, um, to get ahead and whatnot. So I really would see, would encourage you all to like look for mentors in your area that can give you advice, but you can also sort of model yourself after. And yes, there was lots and lots of hard work to get here where there was lots of studying or doing lots of things. But I do also just want to encourage that I had lots of fun where, you know, both I tried to have a good work-life balance, but I also tried to enjoy myself while studying so much and just trying to make the most out of this experience while I was doing it. Um, so thank you all very much for listening. It's been a really great opportunity for me to be here, and I'm now happy to take any questions. Sure. Um, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, currently, my contract is for two years. Um, and so, two years to some people is a short postdoc. Um, so, my current postdoc advisor may have funding for me to do a third year. Um, and then, after so after and then so it, it's, it'll be two or three years, and the unfortunate side to a postdoc is I may go from that postdoc then to another postdoc, and it's not too uncommon to see someone do five years of postdoc experience before they actually go on to a tenure track position. Do you think um, you would have taken another path had you not done the undergraduate research? <laughs> um, I think I would have because I don't think I would have understood that doing a PhD was an option for me. Like, I never even considered a PhD until I did undergraduate research. It wouldn't have even crossed my mind. So yeah, the, the undergraduate research was a huge part of why I'm, why I'm here today at SAMC. Yeah. So I have a question about your research, but I'll ask that afterwards. But I was just in general, I know you like math and biology, but how did you feel about physics? Because I know usually those are linked. And yeah. But did you feel like you had to incorporate that? How did that work? Uh, <laughs> That's yeah. usually a sticking point, you know. Yeah. Um, people are always confused when I say this, but I like math, and I never really felt that good at physics. Um, like, I did fine in physics courses, but not exceptional. Um, and when I was an undergraduate at NC State, I took the bare minute, I think I took the first semester physics, and then I didn't even take the second semester physics. Um, I figured out a way to, to not take it. <laughs> that, that being said, you know, doing a PhD in math biology, physics is a, a large component, so it, it kind of came to bite me in the end. But, so I have definitely needed to use physics in my research and whatnot, but I did not feel particular, particularly good at physics as a student. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other questions? All right, well, thanks so much for coming. Before yes. everyone leaves, uh, we had you fill out one of the raffle tickets. We were going to do a drawing for a sheep's gift card because everybody needs guests, right? So you can come to all your classes. I'm going to let you pick the winner. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hamza Wahid? Yeah, you. Oh, oh, right. Right. <laughs> I, I did want to mention that we do the STEM talks every month. So it's the last Wednesday of the month at 2 o'clock. Uh, if you want, as you're going out, we have the boards here in the back and on the way out. You can always snap a picture so you'll remember when they um, are coming up. Or you can follow Wake Tech STEM, and I post stuff constantly about it. Uh, so it will keep you informed at all times. So anything about STEM-related activities for Wake Tech, the internship, our speakers, um, you know, anything that I think that you would be interested in related to STEM, I put it on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So Wake Tech STEM. Thank you.
much for I'd like to thank our sponsor, LHC Engineers, again, and uh, for our details for you. Thank you very much for coming.